to St Peter's and St John's Church. Wherever you're tuning in from, whether it's locally in Carlisle or further afield, and whether you're a member of the church family or you're just looking in, it's great to have you with us this morning. We meet, as Christians do across the world on Sundays, to give thanks and praise to God, to pray to him and admit the wrongs that we've done and to hear from his word, to hear what the Lord has to say to us, to hear what he is like. And so as we begin, we say the words, um, we say this prayer together and the words will appear on the screen. Do join in with me if you want to. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we'll have our first reading from the Barnsleys. This first Bible reading is Psalm 92. The words will appear on your screen. Psalm 92. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High. To proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. To the music of the ten strings lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the words of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord! How profound your thoughts! The senseless man does not know, fools do not understand. That though the wicked spring up like grass, and all evildoers flourish, they will be forever destroyed. But you, O Lord, are exalted forever, for surely your enemies, O Lord, Surely your enemies will perish, all evildoers will be scattered. You have exalted my horn like that of the wind, wild ox. Fine oils have been poured upon me. My eyes have seen the defeat of my adversaries. My ears have heard the rout of my wicked foes. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of the Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the court of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. Proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no wickedness in him. Hello, welcome to the Barnsley Better Than The News Bulletin. We are the Barnsley Family News Team. My name's Pete and uh, welcome. Today's news is based on Psalm 92 that we have just heard read. The news is, Psalm 92 is a good psalm. That's the end of the news. Thank you for watching. Sorry. <laughs> oh yes, I should say more. It is an encouraging psalm. What? Yes, yes, you're right. It encourages us to praise God. Oh yes, and the psalm tells us that we should sing for joy and proclaim love and 
It reminds us that God is great. It really is a great psalm. What's this? The psalm says that if we praise God, we will be like a beautiful flower in God's house. Cool. cool. That's right, boys. Here's more on this breaking story from Janine, who's on location in uh, the next room. Thanks, Pete. This is Janine, but uh, I'm not in the other room. I'm in the garden. Wow, Psalm 92 really is great, isn't it? Praising God draws us closer to him, uplifts our spirit, and is something that we should never, ever run out of ideas or inspiration for. God has done so much for us. If we said thank you and praised him every minute of every single day, we would still never be able to thank him enough. So how can we praise God more? Here are some ideas. You can shout your praise on a track Yeah. You can say thank you to God. Thank you, God. Up a tree. Yeah. You can praise Jesus singing or playing on an instrument. You can even praise him while you are washing the dishes. Or maybe in the shower. We should remember to praise God when we wake up and start a new day. Thank you God for this new day. We should always praise God at the end of the day too. This is our challenge for you today. We want you to take a photo of things that inspire or help you to praise God today. Back to you in the studio. Thank you, Janine. Our reporter in the front room. Brilliant, yes. There's so many ways that you can praise God and here's some examples sent in to us this week. Here is a photo taken by Robert and Barbara Gardner that inspired them on a recent walk. And here's Steve and Ellie's garden that filled them with praise and wonder at God's creation. Why don't you see how you can praise God today? Visit the HK Church Facebook page and post some pictures of things that inspire you or help you to praise God today. Well, this is the Barnsley Better Than The News Bulletin saying good night or good morning. Thanks for watching.
terms of church family news, just to make you aware that we've put posters up now at both of our church sites so that anybody walking or driving past them uh, can see that we're meeting here online and that, that can point lots of people to uh, what we're doing. Uh, when we used to meet physically in our buildings, we used to look forward to guests and visitors uh, every week. And uh, the same is true online. It's great that people can tune in and have a think through what Christians believe. So uh, just to let you know that those posters have gone up. Uh, secondly, just to make sure that uh, you, you've still got those numbers, we've got the church office number and we've got the church email address, and they're available to absolutely anybody and everybody, whatever their needs are. We're happy to be the first port of call, the last port of call, or any sort of port of call. And we've got loads of volunteers around the parish uh, really willing and eager to help. So do please feel free to pass those numbers on to anybody you know. And in particular, if you know anybody that's falling through the cracks, they would appreciate a phone call, uh, that would appreciate some help, please uh, just make sure their contacts have come to our church and we'll make sure someone phones them up and, and makes a personal offer of help and support. In the next couple of weeks, you'll be seeing more from us. We're planning a crosslink to go around the parish. Uh, it seems a very natural time to try and think through the sorts of issues we're living through and, and to point people to the sort of support and uh, encouragement that's available. And we're working up um, small groups for our children and young people so we're hoping that Sunday schools might be restarting next week and the conversations about our associate minister are still ongoing very positive to have that money and very much looking forward to uh, discerning and welcoming the right person into that role uh, things are slightly up in the air at the moment just in terms of time scales how do you invite someone up for interview uh, on lockdown well you can't but we're uh, doing all the planning that we can so that as soon as uh, things open up we'll be able to make progress with that appointment and get that person in post as soon as possible. So that's all the church family news for now. We're gonna carry on with our time together. And in fact, the way we're gonna continue on our time together is we're gonna hear a short video from Archdeacon Lee Townend. Uh, Archdeacon Lee was due to be with us this Sunday to preach for us and to enjoy time with us, but obviously that's impossible. So I asked him if he'd just record a little encouraging video uh, sharing with us what's been helping him in the past few weeks. So over to Lee. Hi everyone. Uh, I would have loved to have been with you today to preach, but uh, it's not to be, but we will, uh, I'm sure, be together uh, soon. Uh, Andrew, I've been keeping in touch with Andrew, and he asked me just to share uh, a verse very briefly with you guys uh, that's been important to me. And I'm just going to read from Deuteronomy uh, and Deuteronomy 31. And it says this, 31 verse 6, you'll be very familiar with this. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Two things in there which have been important to me throughout my ministry. Uh, that sure and certain knowledge that uh, God in Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. When all else might fail, when other people might fail and leave you, Jesus is there with you. Never will he leave you nor forsake you. But secondly, that part of be not afraid, be courageous, be not afraid. And I'm sure you've heard it said many times from the pulpit. Um, somebody's calculated that on 366 separate occasions, God says to his people, God says to you and to me in the scriptures, be not afraid. Do not be anxious. Fear not. 366 times, that's one for every day of the year, including like this year, a leap year. In my heart, and I often say this uh, metaphorically, in fact, in reality, when you woke this morning, Jesus stood there before you, smiling because he loves you and with his hand outstretched towards you and asking you simply to put your hand in his this day Trust in him and hear the words, be not afraid. The very worst that life could throw at Jesus, he overcame. And if we've got our hand in his, we too can be people who overcome. So be not afraid. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. So go well, friends. Keep safe. And my prayers are very much with you. We come now to admit our failings, the wrong things we've done, to God who knows all things and sees all things. But as we remembered last week, Jesus died that we might be forgiven. So we can approach the Father with confidence, 
because of Jesus' death on the cross and knowing his forgiveness is guaranteed for all who believe and trust in him. Therefore, let us pray this prayer that will appear on the screen together, remembering that our Father hears us and is willing to forgive us. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Our God is abundantly merciful and gracious. He's steadfast and good and kind. He forgives our sins if we trust in him. And he's faithful and just. So may the Lord comfort you and cleanse you from your sin and equip you to be a better child of his today and in the days ahead. Amen. We continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, at this time of uncertainty and confusion, we thank you for our key workers, for all those who continue to go to work whether it's NHS staff or shop workers, binmen, postal workers. Father, for each one of them, we are extremely thankful. We ask that you would strengthen them as they help and serve others. Please would you protect them and keep them from falling ill. God of all comfort, we ask that for all those who are ill, they would know your presence with them. Please would you restore them to full health. But most of all, Lord, would they come to know you, would they come to trust that you are the living God and trust your timing for their recovery. In Jesus' name, Amen. Father, we pray in all this confusion and anxiety that some people would want to know more about the meaning of life and want to understand more about who you are. Father, would you help those people and would you use this time of being locked down to enable us to trust you better, to depend upon you more? and to grow in our love for you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Father, we pray for those who are furloughed or unemployed, and we ask that you would give them patience and a deep trust in you, knowing that you are a holy God who is with them and who helps them. Father, please would you help us as church family, whatever our situation, to be good at encouraging one another, loving one another, and supporting one another as best we can. In Jesus' name, Amen. We pray, finally, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to have our next reading.
The second Bible reading is taken from Matthew, chapter 28, verses 11 to 20. You can read this from your own Bibles at home, or the words will appear on the screen. That's Matthew, chapter 28, verse 11 to 20. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let's pray together, shall we, as we study that passage together. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for these words and for this time. Father, please keep my words faithful to yours. And please help all of us to listen and to understand who it is that speaks through this book, the Bible. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. The key idea at the heart of this little section right at the end of Matthew's Gospel is the idea of disciple, which you'll see in verse 16, or you could say mentor. Many of us uh, throughout our lives, we pick people that we look up to, that we want to learn from. And the, the Bible's word disciple is a word for people that had made Jesus their mentor. They realized lots about Jesus, we'll see that as we go through, but they've made Jesus their mentor and they're following him. They've recognised Jesus as someone to learn from, someone they hope to be more like. Now, those of us who've been alive for a few years have probably had a number of mentors. We might have had teachers that we've looked up to. We might have had people a little bit older than us, maybe at church or in friendship groups. We might have had people in the workplace that we've thought, gosh, how do they do that? Or how can I be a bit more like them? And of course, a mentor, someone to follow, is the sort of thing you're going to want to choose really carefully, isn't it? Choose wisely, because the sort of person you admire, the sort of person you follow, is going to have a really significant impact on you, on your life, on your relationships and your friendships, and on all sorts of things. It's one of the most striking things, isn't it, about Jesus, that even the vast majority of people in this world today who wouldn't want to call themselves Christians think the world would be a better place if everybody lived more like Jesus did. So even unbelievers think Jesus would be a great mentor. So let's just think about that just for a moment, as that will help us get into what Matthew's teaching us right at the climax, right at the finale of his gospel. If you had a mentor, I think there'd be at least four things going on. Uh, you'd know them, you'd learn from them, you'd copy them, and you'd put them first. And when the Bible talks about disciples and followers of Jesus, really strikingly, those are at least four of the things that you see. So the Bible talks about human beings having a relationship with God. God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. That's relationship. The Bible talks about us learning from God. God teaches us. God speaks to us. Uh, that's what he does through the Bible, what he's doing right now. And uh, Christians, disciples, long to read the Bible to hear our Heavenly Father speak to us, perfect words of truth 
and hope. The Bible talks about Christians imitating uh, Christ. Paul says, follow my example as I follow that of the Lord Jesus Christ. We Christians, we who are Christians, want to watch Jesus, learn from Jesus and live a little bit more like Jesus. And then, of course, loyalty. In Matthew's Gospel earlier on, Jesus said, you can't serve both God and money. You can't put two things first in your life. One will be first and one will be second. And indeed, right in the middle of Mark's Gospel, Jesus is very clear. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So let's apply that uh, to G. Thomas. I, I like getting out of my bike. I was out of my bike just a few days ago. Love getting out of my road bike. So let's imagine that I'm being mentored by G. Thomas and G. Thomas is going to be my mentor. That means I'd know him, I'd learn from him, I'd copy him and I'd put him first. So here's me getting to know G. Thomas. That's a relationship with him, isn't it? Hey G, how are you doing? Good to see you. I would know him if he was my mentor. Secondly, I'd learn from him. I'd be learning from him, listening to him, taking his advice, picking his brains. How can I do that? How do you do that? Why do you do it that way? I'd be learning from him all the time. Thirdly, I'd be copying him. If he's won the Tour de France, then presumably the next year, I'd go and win the Tour de France too, wouldn't I? And as you can tell if you look closely, that's a real picture there. I'd not just know him and learn from him, I'd copy him. I'd see what he's doing and I'd put it into practice. And of course, finally, I'd put him first. Wouldn't matter who he was standing next to, G. Thomas's would be the voice that I would listen to. G. Thomas's would be the advice that I'd take. G. Thomas's decisions would be my priorities. I'd know him, I'd learn from him, I'd copy him, and I'd put him first, as you can see from these real life photos that we've just shared with you on the screen. And if you're thinking, well, I'm really glad he chose G. Thomas and not Darcy Bustle, that's a very good call. But you could work this out for yourself, couldn't you? In terms of your office, your workplace, your school, your home, your friendship groups, who are the people that you want to learn from? Who are the people you want to be more like? That's a little bit like what the Bible's talking about when it uses this word disciple that we see in verse 16, the 11 disciples. In fact, that word is used over 260 times in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're gonna focus on it here, particularly in Matthew's Gospel. And I want us to see the one key thing that everybody needs to know. And then I wanna think about how that applies to us if we're thinking these things through, if perhaps we're tuning in and wouldn't want to call ourselves a Christian, how does that apply to us? And then how does it apply to those of us who are Christians, who are seeking to be mentored by the Lord Jesus Christ? So what's the big thing? Well, the big thing is in verses 11 to 15. The big thing is, as we were seeing last week, Jesus' tomb is really empty. Three days after his brutal murder on a Roman cross, the tomb is empty, the body is gone, and he's risen. And if you want to, you could chase back to last week's talk and see five really good pieces of evidence that Matthew's already shown us in this chapter that we can believe it. This, uh, these verses, verses 11 to 15, pick up the story of the guards. So verse 11, while the women were on their way, this happened then between verse 1 and verse 4, and after verse 3, do you remember that the guards um, shook and just uh, collapsed when they saw the angel sitting on the, uh, the stone outside the empty tomb? But then verse 11, they go into the city, they report to the chief priests everything that's happened. And so the chief priests get together with the elders again and they devise a plan. The last time they met, it was a plan to kill Jesus. We can read that in Matthew 26, verses three to five. Now they're trying to make a plan to get away from the fact that Jesus' tomb is empty because they killed him and he rose again to beat death. So they come up with this plan and they tell the guards to tell this story, verse 13. Say that the disciples came during the night and stole the body while you were asleep. And if that report gets back, then, then we'll back you. I mean, these guards were in danger of death. You could be executed for the dereliction of duty that these guards have done. But what's really striking about this account, I don't know if you spotted it as it was read for us earlier, is there's no implication that the Jewish leaders believe the account. There's no indication that they thought the tomb really was empty and Jesus really was risen, having broken death for everyone forever. But there are two really striking things. First is this, have a look at the end of verse 13. 
You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. No Christian would ever put those words in because the Christian wouldn't want to imply that the guards were asleep. Because if the guards were asleep, then the, the, the Christians could have maybe stolen the body, those early disciples. So no Christian would invent that sentence. The only reason for Matthew to put it into his gospel would be that it's true. No Christian would want that uh, idea going around at all, would they? The only point of Matthew including it is truthfulness. But secondly, and even more strikingly, there's no denial that the body really had gone. The historical accounts of Jesus' resurrection, Jesus rising again from the dead, have no doubt at all that the body really was gone from the tomb. The question is, how do you and I deal with the empty tomb? On our uh, Facebook page and on our links under the YouTube link for this talk, you'll find a, 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 a simple link to a very quick two minute video that looks at four really good simple pieces of evidence for the resurrection. Matthew wants us to be in no doubt that this rumour did circulate, this rumour about the guards sleeping and the body being stolen circulated, but it's certainly not the sort of rumour a Christian would invent. And there's no denial, even from the Jews and the chief priests and the elders, even from those early opponents of Christianity, there's no denial that the tomb really was empty. The question is, what do you and I do with the empty tomb? How do you and I explain it? Well, do please get on Facebook and put up all your questions or your thoughts or your comments. Love to work those things through with you. Let's just think about the two uh, different applications then of this passage. For those of us who are thinking these things through, and for those of us who are Christians and are disciples and recognise Jesus as our mentor. First of all, for those considering these things and thinking them through, there's something that's thrown into verse 19 that's very striking. Have a look at verse 19. Jesus is commanding his followers, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Easy to miss what's going on here, but look at the word name. It's not a plural word, it's a singular word. Jesus is not saying baptise people in the names of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, but in the name, the singular name. Christians believe in one God in three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And the claim in verse 19 is that Jesus is fully God equal with the Father, equal with the Holy Spirit. For those of us who are thinking Christianity through, that's the claim we have to engage with. You don't have to think about whether the world would be a better place if everybody was a bit more like Jesus. Being a bit more like Jesus doesn't get us into heaven, and it doesn't engage with the heart of Christianity. The heart of Christianity is the question whether Jesus Christ is God. Who is Jesus is right at the heart of Christianity. And verse 19, Jesus being God, is proved by what we've seen already in this chapter 28 of Matthew's Gospel. Five great reasons last week why the uh, resurrection is clearly true. And another one this week, as Matthew engages with that early rumour um, spread about by the guards in fear of their lives. If you're thinking these things through, don't ask yourself whether it would be easy or not to be a Christian. Don't ask yourself whether it would be uh, comfortable or not to be a Christian, simply ask yourself, is it true? <laughs> you see, if the tomb's empty because Jesus came back to life again three days after his own brutal murder, then Jesus is God's king of the universe. He's king of the world and he's king of you whether you like it or not. And that may be an awkward truth, but it is still a truth. The heart of Christianity is who Jesus is. And if the tomb's empty because he came back to life again, then he's king. And that's why these verses are really helpful for those of us who are thinking these things through, particularly in such times as these that we're living through, where we're closer to death than we normally are, perhaps more fearful of death, perhaps wondering about the meaning behind life, the universe and everything. Well, if that's you, why not check out for yourself whether the tomb really was empty because Jesus really uh, came back to life again. That's the heart of it.
But then secondly, for those of us who are following Jesus, those of us who are disciples, we've got this command and this promise. And again, they both flow back to verses 11 to 15 and the empty tomb. You see, just as I said a moment ago, if Jesus really came back to life again, if he was really brought back from death to life, then he really is God's chosen king. And that means he's got all authority. He's uh, in command of us. And that's going to affect how we as Christians live out our discipleship as our mentor uh, teaches us and we learn and copy from him. Look at how it works in verses 16 uh, to 20. The 11 disciples go to Galilee just as they've been told. And when they see him, some worshipped him and some doubted. I love that. Some understood straight away when they saw him. Um, others took a bit of persuading. But either way, verse 18, he comes to them and they're all disciples. They're all really clear who he is. Remember in some of the resurrection accounts, uh, people don't spot him straight away. They don't pick up straight away who he is. Um, Mary doesn't spot him until he says her name, for example. Well, maybe that's what's going on here amongst the 11. But either way, they worshipped him and Jesus came to them and he said, I've got all authority. You've got three alls going on here. All authority, all nations, all ways. Those of us who are disciples, those of us who recognise Jesus as king and therefore want him to be our mentor, have got these three alls. All authority. Disciples recognise Jesus' authority. All nations. Disciples hear Jesus' command always with you. Disciples know Jesus' presence. Let's think about those three really briefly together now. They all follow on from that worship, don't they? So they worship him in verse 17. And he says, all authority is being given to me. Uh, at the moment, there's a man called Prince Charles who lives in our nation. And he's important. He's influential. But one day, he'll likely become King Charles. There'll be a great coronation and a crown will be put on his head, and he'll be publicly acclaimed as king and ruler of this nation. He will have all authority as King Charles within this nation. And the cross and the resurrection of Jesus are a bit like his coronation, the public celebration of him. He'd always been God's king, but he's now publicly seen as God's king. He's given all authority and disciples will recognise that authority. Well, with his authority, what does he tell us to do? He tells us to go to all nations, that is to absolutely anyone and everyone. For some that has meant getting on an airplane and leaving where they live. But for many of us, what this really means is talking to our next door neighbours and being willing to cross the road. Because the Christian message is for absolutely anyone and everyone. Jesus' resurrection proves that he's king of the whole world. And that means his news needs to go to everyone in that whole world. And in particular, when people become disciples, they'll be baptised. But after being baptised, they'll keep on learning, verse 20, they'll keep on being taught. And here it is, disciples make disciples. All Christians are called by the king with all authority to go to all nations. Not just King Charles, but King Charles, the head of the armed forces. If a general gives you a command in the armed forces, you simply salute and get on with it. You don't argue. So King Charles with authority becomes General Charles with the command. And then thirdly, you get the glorious and uh, precious promise of verse 20. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age, all authority to all nations and always with us. This is not King Charles. This is not the general who we salute. This is the best friend. This is the right hand man. This is the person with us, so precious, to help us obey this command. Now there's lots of things going on here that link back to other parts of Matthew's gospel. King David, all authority. Abraham, all nations, the end of the exile, always with us. Or going back to the uh, temptations we looked at just two or three weeks ago, where Satan says to Jesus, do this and I'll give you all these kingdoms. 
but through obeying his father, Jesus has come to authority over all the kingdoms. Or verse 20, surely I'm with you always. One of the early names of Jesus in Matthew's gospel is Emmanuel, God with us, as we remember each Christmas time. So for those of us who are thinking these things through, discipleship means recognising who Jesus is. Is the tomb empty? Is Jesus God's king? And for those of us who are Christians, discipleship means recognising who Jesus is. The tomb's empty. He's God's king. He's got authority over us, authority to command us. And he will be present even to the very end of the age. Many of us find evangelism hard. Of course we do. But let's notice three little things. First of all, there are a number of things that all Christians are called to and some are gifted in. All are called to pray, some have the gift of prayer. All are called to give and some have the gift of giving. All are called to evangelise and some have the gift of evangelism. So just because you don't have the gift of it doesn't mean you're not called to do it. You and I are called to walk in obedience to the one with all authority. Secondly, obedience is the main reason, but not the only reason why you and I seek to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I think there are at least three reasons. One is obedience. The second is compassion, and the third is excitement. We share the gospel because of obedience to Jesus Christ, but we also share it in compassion for those we know and love, because if eternity is true and there's only two places to spend it, we can't love people and not tell them about that. We can't love them and fail to warn them. And of course, thirdly, because of excitement, because we see Jesus glorified, God is most glorified, when we're most satisfied and joyful in him, we long to see Jesus glorified in saving very many people. Third little observation is lots and lots of Christians love verse 20 but struggle with verse 19. And we can't have verse 20 applying to us if verse 19 doesn't apply to us. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples, to the, uh, uh, the original little church. And he says, here's my command and here's my promise. Many Christians, tragically, they want to keep the promise and ignore the command. Well, you and I can't do that, can we? We can't do that. The disciples, you see, just then, just as disciples today, are always learning from Jesus. To be a disciple is to recognise our ongoing need to learn, to recognise Jesus as God's King, who's our amazing mentor. We know him, we learn from him, we seek to copy him, and we aim to put him first. And so here at Matthew 28, this is the very end of Matthew's gospel. Jesus commissions deeply imperfect followers with all his authority to go to all the nations, knowing that he's always with them. Those of us who are following him today hear the same commission with the same authority, the same command, the same amazing promise. You'll do it in your way and I'll do it in my way. You'll do it in your character and I'll do it in my character, but we must do it. And if we're still thinking these things through, if we're just looking, if we're wondering about Christianity, uh, we at Houghton and Kingmore Church would love to give opportunities to think these things through. Uh, you could very easily go to our Facebook page and, and ask any questions you've got. Uh, you could very e easily uh, look at our little uh, booklet we put up last week with some evidence for the resurrection. You could watch the little video that we've linked to uh, after this service. And we're hoping in the next week or two to put something on, on a weekly basis that will just give people a chance to look in. What are the simple basics that Christians believe? How can we ask really good questions about them to discern whether they are true or not? I'm going to pray. Let's pray together as we close. Heavenly Father, we long to know what is true and to respond rightly to what is true. Father, please help us to think through this eyewitness account from Matthew and discern what is true. And Father, if it is true that the tomb is empty and Jesus is your chosen king, then please help us to treat him as such in our lives. Father, you know we need your help in that. And so we pray in the powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing as we close our time together a gorgeous song reminding us that it's in Christ and Christ alone that hope is found. Please either sing along 
or enjoy watching the words as you listen to the music. Well, that's the end of our formal time together, but don't feel that uh, everything needs to stop right now. If you're with someone else, why not keep your Bibles open? Why not share what's encouraged you? Why not discuss what's confused you? Uh, if you're not with someone else, there's phones, there's texting, there's the church family Facebook page. Uh, why not go old school and write someone a letter? But let's not forget what the Lord has taught us together this morning, and let's work out how we can chew it over with someone else that will help you and I, and will certainly encourage them. Facebook page, YouTube songs to listen to, phones, emails, all sorts of ways to keep involved with what the Lord has taught us this morning through his precious, powerful word.